and welcome to Veterans Remember. I'm Dick Gooding, your host of Veterans Remember, a series of conversations with Hopkins and veterans who have served our country during wartime and peace. In our discussions, we hope to share with our viewers some of the experiences of our veterans who served during World War II, Korean conflict, wars in Vietnam, the Gulf, Iraq, and currently in Afghanistan. They share with us their personal stories and the impact their service has had on their own lives as well as on the lives of all of us today. I'm joined today by Frank Chase, retired Air Force Lieutenant Colonel who served his country proudly for 20 years. Frank, how are you? Fine, thank you, Dave. It's good to see you and I'm glad that you're uh, uh, able to join us today and tell us a little bit about, uh, about your story and your stories. Uh, first of all, I understand you grew up right here in town, and maybe you could tell us a little bit about your early days in Hopkinton. I'm native born, uh, 1934, uh, you remember that, and uh, grew up here, lived here all my life except uh, when I was off in the military and off for a little uh, activity here and there, but primarily I've lived here for 78 years now. Wow, that's a that's a long time, I'll tell you. And uh, uh, but you did uh, you served in uh, in the Air Force for 20 years. I did. Yeah. Uh, I grew up here in Hopkinton. Uh, many uh, of the older folks in town may recall my mother as the music teacher around town. She taught piano and violin. We grew up on Ash Street. And I think you were one of her students. Ah, uh, yes, I was one of her prize students. Uh, I think she moved me on to playing sports. Thought that was better use of my time. She did the same thing with me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, back then, the the town was pretty quiet. I think our population, uh, when I was a young boy, was something like under three thousand people. Lots of dairy cows. Lovely community. Love Hopkinton, still love Hopkinton. <laughs> well, you, uh, after you left Hopkinton High School, you went to Boston University. I did. And I joined the Air Force ROTC, uh, a very uh, selective thing. They said, hey, you can uh, take either ROTC, which would be the Army, or the Air Force. And I said, oh, I don't care. And my a buddy next to me jabbed me in the ribs and says, no, Frank, you want to join the Air Force. I said, okay. <laughs> and uh, that's how, uh, how uh, discerning I was about what service I joined. But I'd been impressed. Uh, I wanted to get into the military because I was impressed by the veterans of World War II. Uh, about the age seven, I uh, was... Uh, uh, my father came in from the garage, he was building a boat out in the garage, came in on a Sunday and said to my mother and my grandmother who lived with us and my sister, says, Pearl Harbor has been bombed, we're at war. And I thought, I asked the question, what's war? And they indicated they were pretty upset about it, but I never really could understand what war was. But then I observed the, the uh, men and, and women of Hopkinton quickly joined up. Uh, and, and I discerned that their, the reason for doing so was that they felt it their duty to support their country and to serve in the protection of the country. So I got very positive feelings about the military veterans as they returned to Hopkinton. And I, I hope to grow up just like one of, the, one of them. Well, you, you joined, uh, that was in, what, 1958? 50, 50 uh, let's see, 50, the ROTC I joined in 50, when I graduated from high school, was 52, and it would be, uh, I graduated from college in 58. 58. And I was commissioned as a second lieutenant at that point, and uh, at this point they were reducing the number of people in the sure, military. Sure, it was after, after Korea. Korea was were, over uh, and we went through our normal right. decline. So they said, there's no hurry, pick a date you want to go in. So I said, how about December? So they said, fine, and they cut me some orders and said, report to Lackland Air Force Base uh, on December 24th. So I drove down there when December came on December 24th, reported at the 
front gate and I said, I'm here for class 58K to learn to be a pilot. And they said, there is no 58K <laughs> class and nobody's here. And I said, well, it's gotta be, here's my orders. And they said, you may have the orders, but there's no class. So they gave me a blanket and a pillow and told me to go to a huge barracks, probably held 200 people, it was totally empty. And I spent the night there thinking, oh wow, what a way to start a career. I've gone to the wrong place, the wrong time or something. <laughs> well, it turned out, I found one other guy roaming the halls there and he was from Puerto Rico. And he was the first Puerto Rican pilot to be. And he was so glad to see me and I was so glad to see him. And we both had the same orders to report there. Turned out what had happened, we were the furthest geographically from Lackland, Texas. They had mailed us cancellation of our orders, which never got there before we had left. So we were the only two in the class until the following month when, when the class actually did form and we joined the rest. Yeah. Did you know uh, right from the start that you uh, were going to be a pilot? Yes, yes. I'd, uh, that was my goal. I wanted to fly the hottest jet in the world and at that time it was the F-86 Sabre. That's what I wanted to get into, so man, I was ready to go. So tell us about flight school. Well, we went through uh, courses in, uh, went to a civilian course, Southern Airways in Georgia, where incidentally I called my to-be wife and said, let's get married, I got a paycheck. So she came to Georgia, we got married, and so she's been with me through the entire service. Uh, went through basic, training with conventional reciprocating engine helica um, fixed wing aircraft mm -hmm. and then I went to another part of Texas Bryan Texas Texas A&M is there sure. and uh, learned how to fly jets in preparation of going to on to the advanced course in F-86 and partway through the course it dawned on me as much as I wanted to fly jets I, I wanted to be a helicopter pilot. Once I saw an Army One land, that was the ugliest thing I've ever seen. Parts go in every direction. The ground was shaking as this thing landed. It was an H-37. It was, I believe, nobody could ever fly something like that. So it was quite a challenge. And as I, I, then I got a, worked my way into getting a ride with an Air Force helicopter pilot in a smaller helicopter. And I was so excited about this challenge that I changed my direction from F-86s to helicopters. And I thought, uh, and probably the prime reason was I didn't want to drop napalm so much as I wanted to rescue people. And of sure. course, that was the main purpose of the helicopter. Sure, did most uh, pilots or all Air Force pilots uh, receive fixed wing training before helicopter yes. training? All, all Air Force pilots were trained at that time uh, in conventional aircraft mm -hmm. before they could go into helicopters. The Army uh, later took over the initial training and uh, they changed it so that the Air Force pilots went directly to helicopters and never got the fixed wing training before that. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, so you, you uh, finished up your uh, helicopter training in, uh, uh, at Lackland, uh, then what did you do after yeah, that? Yeah, it, it actually was at Randolph where I fixed the helicopter. Then they, I, one of the things they did was send me off to the mountains to learn to fly helicopters in mountains, and that was out at Stead Air Force Base in Nevada. Then I got assigned to Niagara Falls Municipal Airport where we had a rescue outfit, and uh, sort of I, I learned from the, the guys who really knew how to fly them. Yeah. Uh, and that was my first duty assignment. Then I was uh, transferred to uh, a beautiful place, West Hampton Beach in Long Island, New York, where uh, the Suffolk County Air Force Base was located and flew helicopters there. Hmm. Well, I understand that there are uh, uh, some basic types of uh, Air Force helicopters that, that really becomes the focal point of, uh, of, of any Air Force pilot's career. Perhaps you could walk us through those, Frank. Right, well, this is ancient history. The Black Hawk pilots now would uh, would not believe what we flew, but you may recall MASH, the hell, the- uh, Oh, absolutely. And, and the, uh, the, had the, the little helicopter with the bubble in the front right. and the wire hanging out the rear end, uh, right. yeah, sort of mesh. 
and you see them come flying in at the beginning of each program. That was the H-13, and that was the first helicopter I flew. It barely had enough power to get off the ground, and in fact, I was one of the first full-sized pilots to be allowed to fly a helicopter. Originally, anybody who weighed more than 100 pounds uh, couldn't get the helicopter to take off, so they got the little guys to fly helicopters at first. So then they got bigger engines or something, and they let me join them. Hmm. I wasn't quite so heavy then as I was now, but I, but we kind of had to take running takeoffs like a fixed-wing aircraft did to, to get airborne. And after the H-13, that was the Bell uh, helicopter, I got into the H-19, which is stronger and bigger, and that was the Sikorsky aircraft. We flew that. Then the H-21, which was a banana-type helicopter with ro tandem rotor blades in the front and the back. And uh, following that, uh, I got into the H-43, which was the helicopter I flew for most of my career. I flew others too, but my primary aircraft was the H-43 Husky, which was, ready for this, a intermeshing, counter-rotating rotor blades that go like this, around like this, and uh, it was not a plush aircraft at all, but it held the world's altitude uh, record. It could f have a lot of lift, so we mm -hmm. could take off with w a lot of weight. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the one that I flew most of my career as my primary aircraft. Were, were, uh, you were involved with uh, different types of missions Yes. Uh, as a helicopter pilot in the Air Force. Maybe you could tell, uh, tell our friends who are watching today a little bit about those missions, the types of missions, and, and how they may, and maybe you can even cite some examples. Be glad to. May I, quickly, I, I jotted down so I wouldn't forget what I had categorized here. <laughs> I, 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 Dick, I kind of think there are four categories of what a combat rescue pilot uh, does. What are the missions of a, of a helicopter pilot for combat rescue? And I sort of arbitrarily categorized it as air evac, and I'll explain that and give you an example of mm -hmm. that. LBR, which stands for local base rescue. Again, I'll get into that. Air crew recovery. Uh, I'll get into that. It's called ACR, air crew recovery. And finally, my catch-all phrase, the humanitarian mission. Uh, let me start off with air evac. What am I talking about? Clearly, each of these, the, the objective is to save lives. That's, that's what the uh, objective is. And uh, as an illustration, when we first went to Vietnam, I was amongst those that were sent in uh, 1965 to Vietnam. That was the big buildup. The Marines went into Da Nang. The Army went into south part of South Vietnam. And uh, the first Army outfit of any size to go in there was 173rd Airborne. Mm -hmm. The Airborne folks, uh, their first big, the question at stake was, can American Army people compete with jungle Viet Cong, it, it's, there, it's the Viet Cong's environment to be in these very difficult to tr uh, weather conditions and uh, terrain conditions. So people were asking the question, can our boys really hack it? Well, the first test was the 173rd operation. They went into the search and destroy operation into uh, the Hobo Woods, which is about 40 miles north of Tonsonut, Saigon, and uh, they went in there with helicopters, flew them in, because there's no roads, of course, to right. get into the jungle. They, got in, they went in there, were dropped off about 400 and something, as I understand, uh, fighting men, with uh, they had some artillery support from the New Zealand people and the Australian people. They went in there, and unfortunately, or fortunately, they ran into a regiment of... Uh, Viet Cong. The regiment, uh, and they, they, were, they went up some hills, the, uh, the 173rd, encountered the Viet Cong, and it got to be a real bloody fight. It was the 8th of November. 
Uh, both sides suffered heavy casualties. Uh, and by the end of the day, both sides, I think, decided to declare victory and withdraw from each other. Right. And the Viet Cong went further up north. The, the Americans, during the cover of night, came down the, the hills in the jungle. And the, the jungle over these hills was a, a canopy of three canopies. Uh, it was about 250 foot high, would be the highest canopy. Then there'd be a lower canopy a little bit below that. And then finally, a third canopy, a triple canopy coverage. Uh, so they, they dragged their wounded and, and dead down the hill and clustered at the bottom of the hill and asked for us to come in and pick, them, pick up the wounded in the morning. So uh, this is an example of an air evac mission where we go in and the basic idea is simply to bring them out, take them to medical help. So we came in the next morning, first, first dawn. We were able, we're now faced with a 250 foot jungle. Our hoist, which is our normal way of picking somebody up, uh, are 100 feet long. We got 300 foot or 250 feet of canopy. That's not gonna work. Fortunately, some uh, bombs and artillery had blown holes in the canopy. We were able to fly in, sneak below one canopy, move it over and sneak a little lower, and eventually get down so we could use our hoist. So we brought out, uh, we brought out 67 people in that operation. Of course, mm -hmm. that was several trips in and out. And I can tell you the first observation I had when I, when I get down close enough to the ground to see General Williamson, who was the commander of the 173rd, was sitting on a, a log and he was in a posture, something like this, with the dead and the wounded all around him. So he had like 67 dead and wounded around. And I was able to glance up the hill that they just come down. It was red. It, blood was just blood red. Terrible, terrible yeah. sight. Mm. And I, I, I emphasized with that poor general and his troops laying all around. Yeah. Uh, but we, we, we did our job. Next day, I'm looking at the he newspaper headlines. Headlines say, Americans win great victory, right. uh, compete with the Viet Cong. And uh, I'm sure the general was sitting there with you know, a powerful look and certainly quite a contrast between what how he said. felt yeah. the day before. What's the, what's the next mission's uh, Next type mission type? is LBR. LBR is a firefighting mission primarily. The studies show us that most airplanes, when they crash, uh, crash near the base because they're trying to get home, and they, and they burn, and the pilot often dies from being burned. So we invented a helicopter, somebody invited a, invented a helicopter with a rotorwash system that would blow uh, the fresh air. If you got up to the, next to the cockpit and it's burning and the pilot's trapped in there, the air would be fed into the pilot so he could survive for a few minutes getting fresh air and blows the flames out of the way. We brought a couple of firefighters with us in this mission. They would, and a medic, and they would come out of the helicopter, use this fire, uh, fire equipment that we brought with us, a, a big fire extinguisher, mm -hmm. so to speak, break their way into the cockpit, pull the, with the flames and so forth still going on, bring the pilot out, and uh, hopefully he would uh, mm. survive. Well, this happened in 66 in Vietnam. Uh, one night, about midnight, the alarm went off. I was on alert. Uh, an airplane was coming in, shot up. It was an Army Huey, as a matter of fact. Five people on board, and it was coming in, had his tail rotor shot off. Now, when a tail rotor gets shot off, your helicopter spins like this, and you lose control. They came down, we, we took off in about three minutes. We were airborne as they came in. They crashed and we followed them right into their crash. They burst into flames. Five people on board, the, the uh, fuel was burning. The, the, uh, they had ordnance of all sorts of stuff on board, grenades and so forth. That was cooking off. And our firefighters went in uh, made a path so they could, and they were still alive. All five were mobile to some degree. 
firefighters drug a uh, couple out and the couple others were able to get out by themselves. Our medic, who was with us, and he didn't have bunkers on like the firefighters, one of the bravest things I've ever seen in my life. He went into the flames with just a flak vest and ordinary flight suit on and with his uh, hands was beating out the flames on, on these, these people who were, yeah. the, the army people were actually burning and pulled them out. And so we got five out that time and uh, then we went back to our, to our yeah. alert facility, we had a bunk in there. I got finished filling out paperwork, went in, and here's this, Aaron Buggy was his name, uh, this medic, already up in his bunk, sound asleep. My legs are shaking like this, and he's asleep, and I could never, I don't know how anybody could do it after mm -hmm. going through that. Jeez. What's the next type of mission? Uh, uh, the ACR, the Air Crew Recovery Mission. This is the classic, this is the more complex mission. The idea is uh, when an air crew member gets shot down over North Vietnam or wherever in combat, uh, the, the priority for everybody is get that pilot, save him from capture or being killed by the enemy. We have two, two helicopters typically that take off together. We have four gunships that go with us. Uh, usually the A-1 at that time was the, the number one uh, aircraft to sh shoot up the area to right. help us. Uh, and then we... Uh, uh, so, so that was the, the makeup of a normal mission. We go off, the S Sandys was that typical code name, and the rescue crews would, would all go off in the formation. Uh, the Sandys would come down, where, once we knew where the survivor was, would come down, uh, make some passes by, see if they got shot up or not, and if they got shot up, they would shoot up, of course, the person sure. shooting at them, whereas the helicopter had no capability of shooting. Or, or no, it was very vulnerable. Well, in uh, in my example of one of this type of mission, uh, it was in um, I think it was the fifth sixty five. It was again in Vietnam. Another, you served twice in Vietnam. Yeah, I, I was in there twice, yeah. and I was in on temporary duties many other times. Sure. Uh, the the uh, Huey had. Uh, got wounded and uh, the Huey had been shot down in battle about, oh, I think it was about 20 miles away from the base. And the Viet Cong were overrunning their position. Five people were again in the helicopter and they had, had formed a defensive perimeter. We're trying to hold off the enemy. And uh, so we were dispatched. We had four escorts. We didn't have any Sandys available, so a couple army gunships came with us, the helicopters that had guns, and two F-4 fighter, Air Force fighters, and we only could go with one helicopter because our other helicopter was down at the moment. Mm. So we went flying out and uh, terrible weather, monsoon weather, thunderstorms and all that. So the two Army helicopters said, hey, this is weather, well, can't do it, we're turning back. So the two, two gunships turned back. Meanwhile, the F-4s up above said, hey, we're going to bug all these thunderstorms. We can't even see the ground. We can't do much for you, so we're turning back. So that left us the helicopter. So we kept pressing, and we were able to locate the, uh, the downed. They were in a rice paddy. We were able to locate them. And uh, we flew on. It's about then, the skies opened. It was not bad weather. We flew in, picked up the five uh, Army uh, survivors and all their equipment, loaded it aboard, and mm. booked it on back to base and wow. lived in. It's fascinating. How about uh, the final mission? The final one is the, what I've called a humanitarian mission. I was in Korea, and there was a big flood. And we had uh, the Korean nationals, some, some people who lived in the village, not too far away from our, our base. Uh, the river was rising and they were on a little piece of land left and the river was about to go over them. And uh, so we flew out there and landed on the island, uh, picked up, there were 34 Koreans at, that were about to be washed away. Our helicopter will carry maybe seven, eight people, plus our crew, if we cram them all in. 
And we sa I said, hey, we can't take off with just a few because the rest are going to be gone by the time we get back. So I got out of my helicopter and we started ramming the people into the helicopter. Stuck, we ended up with 34 people aboard that helicopter. And I had about, got to about 30 and the last four we couldn't fit through the door. So I said, man, they're going to die if we don't get them in. So I got out there and I was shoving the last few in and there was this one woman that she was resisting. No, 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 no way. You know, I don't know what she was saying, but she was saying in Korean and I was thinking, what's wrong with this person? Everybody's going to die if I don't get them in here. So I shoved her as hard as I could shove her to, just to stick people together like sardines in a can. And she just kept screaming. And finally somebody says, hey, Captain, uh, she's got a baby. That's why she won't let you push her. And she was holding a baby on the, mm -hmm. in, a, in a device on her <clears throat> back. And I was trying to ram that poor baby against the side of the helicopter inside. And uh, eventually we, we turned her around and got the baby and got the 34 out. Listen, Frank, I want to uh, thank you very much for uh, sharing these experiences of your helicopter piloting. Uh, and I know that you have retired back to Hopkinton and opened up a whole new uh, real estate career. And uh, uh, we're very pleased that you uh, decided to share this with us today. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for joining us in this episode of Veterans Remember. I also want to thank Frank Chase for sharing his experiences in the Air Force during a distinguished career. Veterans Remember is a series of conversations with Hopkins and veterans who have served their country during wartime and peace. They have personally helped to preserve our freedom and have made numerous contributions to the town of Hopkinton. I'm Dick Gooding, your host, and I thank you very much for joining us today on Veterans Remember and want to thank Frank Chase for this experience. Thank you, Dick. Thank you.